Okay, uh, joining me today is Brian Jones from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, Brian is a region native, uh, native of Laporte, Indiana. Uh, and unfortunately, Brian lost his mom uh, to COVID-19 uh, back in May. She was one of the earlier deaths uh, that the region, region had from this horrible disease. Um, Brian's here today to talk a little bit about his mother, Cynthia Hyde, uh, who was also a Laporte native and a, a longtime resident of Valparaiso Nursing Home. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about your mom and uh, who she was as a person. Well, you know, I, I guess uh, you, you got to start with she was a mom, right? You know, she was a, a great individual um, who battled a lot, uh, you know, through her, uh, uh, through her young career. Uh, my sister and I have a younger sister. Um, uh, she was a single mom. Uh, our par parents divorced uh, very early on. Um, and mom battled through, uh, you know, after graduation, a, a, a single mom and navigated her way through school with the help of, you know, my aunts uh, and my grandparents and uh, graduated from uh, Purdue in 1979 and, uh, you know, became a registered nurse and, you know, worked her way uh, the same way as we uh, were young kids, uh, you know, bouncing around between family as mom worked, you know, the three to 11 shift or the late night shift or the early morning shift and, you uh, uh, you know, we found a way as a, as a tight knit family to uh, to kind of work our way through that. And mom ended up uh, remarrying for a while and uh, uh, had, a, had a stepdad for a while. And that eventually, uh, you know, ended as well. But, uh, um, you know, about uh, 19, uh, I don't know, 93, 94, maybe um, mom became diagnosed with multiple scler uh, sclerosis. And that kind of started her initial health care decline. Um, and but battled through that as well. You know, it was seems like every time mom had a struggle or, or something was, uh, you know, uh, it landed in her lap, she always found a way to battle through. And uh, for years did well, um, finally became kind of weaker and weaker because of the, the, the multiple sclerosis that ended up attacking her, uh, you know, her immune system, her lungs, um, ended up with COPD and others and uh, finally made the decision after numerous hospitalizations to, to kind of put her in the nursing home. And that was really mom's decision. Um, and for 10 years, Mark, she thrived in uh, the Life Care Cellars, uh, Center at the Willows. You know, she was a, uh, she was the president of the nursing home, uh, you know, association huh. and uh, just loved life and really, uh, you know, battled uh, all the way till the end. So uh, she was a, a great, definitely a great lady. Well, you know, I think a lot of people uh, overlook just how strong somebody can be when they are a single parent uh, and they have to fight their way through those challenges of being a parent and taking care of a family and enriching themselves and building an education and everything else while dealing with all those challenges. I, I, uh, I can certainly appreciate that coming from a, a woman who was a single mom for the first several years of my life. So um, sounds like she was a, just a fantastic person. She was a nurse and Obviously, that gave her a unique perspective on COVID-19 uh, when, it, when it began in, in the spring of 2020. Tell me a little bit about what she was uh, saying and feeling about the virus when we first began to learn what this thing was. Yeah, you know, the, the crazy thing about it is, is I think uh, being a nurse was mom's uh, best, uh, you know, attribute from a professional end, but off the, oftentimes her worst because mom was an advocate for her own care, right? So she knew what was going on. She wanted this check. She was speaking with the doctor. She was telling the nurses, you know, what she wanted, what she needed. Um, and, and so living, you know, three hours apart here and from Toledo, living back at home in Valpo, it was also really good to have because, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to be there all the time because mom was very, the one thing that didn't, her, her faculty started to, you know, go away. Her, she, you know, was ended up uh, pretty much in the chair and her motorized chair and had numerous other issues, but her mind never left her. And so she was still sharp as a tack. Um, and she knew exactly what was going on and, and knew, uh, you know, what was happening. And, and, and um, so that was the tough part, you know, uh, you know, as I shared with you in the email, the, the, the toughest thing in the world was is that, you know, they stopped all visitation, right? So the last time that my family, uh, you know, I have a 17-year-old son, a 13-year-old daughter, uh, my wife, you know, my sister uh, lives in uh, right outside Chicago. She has a young daughter. You know, the last time we saw her was around Christmas. And, you know, I went back in, in uh, you know, er, mid to late January myself to take her Christmas tree down in the nursing home. And that was the last time I saw her because, 
you know, right away, March, whatever it was, the beginning of March, the next thing you know, don't come in. And so the only way that I, we were able to communicate with mom was, you know, I called her six days a week and we communicated back and forth via FaceTime and, you know, other things. But, you know, she didn't leave her room. You know, she had her own room because of the immune compromise, a compromise she was. She had her own bathroom in that room. Um, you know, everything was there. And the only people that she saw in and out of that room were those nurses and the nurse's aides that brought her her meals and helped her in the shower and things like that. And so, you know, she did her part to really ensure that, you know, uh, she was protected and, um, you know, and I think really understood. And I think we all, you know, understood the, the severity of what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't really, you know, kind of take the full aspect in of, of what this means until, you know, the day she called that she ended up with the virus. Yeah, so she was. She was she was taking all these precautions and the facility itself, it sounds like they they were obviously very familiar with what her condition was. You said she had COPD, uh, MS. These are all things that made her, uh, including her age, very susceptible to this. So sure. what's it like when, you know, all these precautions are being taken and you think things are being protected and then you find out uh, uh, she is positive for COVID-19? And, and when did you find that out? Yeah, I, you know, I was trying to remember and, and looking back, I think it was, you know, uh, uh, you know, late February or not, excuse me, February, but late that month because she wasn't in the hospital very long. Um, but I remember, you know, the day that we talked, you know, she, she, she wasn't surprised. She just wasn't, you know, and, and, you know, that we have a, a saying around here in our world now that, no matter what you do, you can take every precaution in the world, and and I don't you know diminish any of those at all. But the virus is going to virus. It, it does what it wants. It has a mind of its own. It finds a way to do whatever it wants to do. And unfortunately, you know, mom is uh, was a sitting duck. Um, she you know she checks all the boxes right. Um, now, the side note to this, you know, my mother has been battling health issues for ten years. Um, she had been on a ventilator four to five times before because of COP you know, issues. She had been septic twice, kidney failure. I mean, the list goes on and on of all the times that mom, I drove home thinking this was it. And then, you know, my, my family called my mom the Ever Ready Bunny. Um, she had two stuff, stuffed Ever Ready Bunnies in her room. Um, she always bounced back. And, you know, even after mom got this virus, she, you know, got kind of sick in the hospital for a few days um, and then started to kind of bounce back. Um, I was, we were talking on the phone when she was in the hospital and, um, you know, she seemed to be turning the corner a little bit. And I remember telling my wife, hanging up the phone one night and my, I, I looked at her and I said, my Lord, she's going to beat this. And then things unfortunately spun, you know, kind of uh, out of control very, very fast after that. Um, and, and so I think it was just a frustration that, you know, as, as she said, we did everything right. You know, she didn't, you know, I, I didn't, she hadn't seen her grandkids since Christmas. She, you know, didn't get to see her kids. She, she, we did everything by the book and the end result, unfortunately, still was there. And uh, so I think that was her frustration more than anything. And, you know, and I think I shared with you that, you know, one of the things that we talked about, one of the last things was, is, you know, she just, she wanted us to be careful, but still live our, live our life, right? Because she hadn't for seven weeks. She lived in a 14 by 14 room and didn't live a life. That, that has to be so hard. How, how did you stay connected with her? I mean, were you able to FaceTime with her or do those types of things? You hear a lot about the, about that or Zoom or other types of things that people have been using. Yeah, that was, God love my mother, but she was a little technically challenged. <laughs> um, we, 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 we did find ways to, you know, FaceTime back and forth and talk a lot. Like I said, I, I, uh, I, I called mom, you know, six days a week. My sister spent uh, a lot of time on the phone with her. They connected on a different level. They were very close as friends more than anything. And uh, so we spent a lot of time communicating with her that way. Um, we did when she was in the hospital, obviously, as, as long as she could communicate. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I have no concerns at all that she knew we were there. Um, you know, uh, they gave us the opportunity, you know, as mom started to slide to, to come and, you know, I knew mom would not want that because at the time we just had too many uncertainties. And I knew if I went and even with the proper PPE, 
to go in and see her that I would have to isolate for 14 days upon return to my family. And, and it, it just, you know, we made the decision not to go and, and because I knew that that's what mom would want. Um, you know, she didn't know any better, you know, and she knew I talked to her before um, she was innovated. Um, and I, I just kind of knew that things, you know, were, were sliding downhill. And I'll be honest with you, Mark, even when I, when she was intubated, I thought, well, it's my mom. I'm, we'll give it seven or eight days and she'll probably come back off the vent and here we go again. Yeah. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your last conversation with your mom uh, before she, she was intubated. What, what was that like? And, and what did you talk about? You know, I think more than anything that day, there was, it was a different conversation than the times that had happened before. Um, you know, she had been really sick a few times before. Um, and those times maybe she wasn't quite as with it uh, because it was, uh, you know, whether it be a septic issue or uh, she had battled some uh, uh, MRSA related bacteria in her lungs that her lungs would get so bad that she wouldn't able to communicate. Um, you know, that's one of those things early on too, is, is we've learned a lot is, is, you know, back in May being an early issue, the first thing that the, the thought was, is, was to protect the lungs, right? And they, so they were innovating a lot earlier than they were right now, because they're trying to extend that innovation and really, you know, use some of the other medicines that we're, we're seeing on the market and things like that. So it, it was scary. I mean, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it, it was a very short conversation. We had talked a few days before. Um, you know, they called and, and told me that they would going to need to intubate. And I said, well, is she awake and alert? They said, yes. And, uh, you know, uh, we spoke very briefly. I said, are you okay? And she just said, I was scared. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we said some things and, you know, I try not to get emotional, but uh, it's a tough, tough conversation. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. I, and we appreciate you, you sharing it with, with us. Uh, so she, th this sounds like this was a fight that went on for a while, because if I heard it correctly, she was diagnosed sometime in late February. <clears throat> I, I was trying to pull up the date here, and I, I can't find it exactly um, <clears throat> when she went, but I want to say it was sometime around that. I mean, she battled it for a while, but it wasn't an extreme uh, amount of time. I was just going to try to see if I could pull up real quick the, uh, if I did find out what happened, but um it, 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 you know, she, for a few days, was able to stay in, uh, you know, the, uh, the nursing home. Um, and so I was just looking here, uh, trying to see when she actually went in. So, yeah, May, I, I was wrong, Mark. May 13th, pardon my apologies. Oh, that's okay. So, uh, she was admitted to the hospital on May 13th. Okay. And which hospital was she taken to? Uh, Porter. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I will tell you to add to that, I, you know, I, I said um, the, the reason that mom lived as long as she did for many reasons, not just COVID related, um, was a, a credit to the physicians that worked with her. Um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Young, the infectious disease physician, uh, that she spent years working with was the champion to keep her alive um, for many, many years. She was an unbelievable physician and, and was there through it all with her. Um, and that staff at, at Porter in the, in the ICU was unbelievable. Um, you know, they, they treated mom several times before. So, you know, not just with this COVID, but with all her other issues, they knew her, they knew her history. Um, you know, so uh, I, I said to my family, and I've said it more than once, you know, uh, mom didn't die alone. She did. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, she died with family. They had become her family. Yeah. And in, in essence, they were a greater family to her. Definitely. She was a, she was a dedicated healthcare professional right. for her. So I, those people there made it a lot easier for all of us. I will say that. All my mom is obviously she's got two sisters. Uh, my uh, her her father passed away in February, uh, not of COVID, uh, but my grandparents, my grandmother, 
at 95 years old is still living uh, in a nursing home in, in Laporte, uh, has dementia. Um, and this has been very hard on her as well uh, with the dementia, with my two aunts trying to battle, you know, not knowing what's going on and not being able to see her too. So, uh, you know, while mom ended up succumbing to the virus, it's really unfortunately, you know, doubled down on the dementia that my grandmother has had. Her health is great, <laughs> but the, the mind is, is failing. And, and when you don't have that family interaction, you know, I got to see my grandmother in, I don't know what it was, uh, maybe uh, October or November and talked to her for 15 minutes through a window. <laughs> you know, I had to, I'm standing outside. So we've all been affected by it at some point uh, in some way. Yeah. So your mom, how many other, how many siblings do you have, Brian? I, I have one uh, younger sister. Okay. And what's your younger sister's name? Jamie. J-A-I-M-E Jones. And how old is Jamie? Uh, let's see, I'm 48. So I think she's 45 now. Okay. And does she live here in the region as well? Uh, she lives in Chicago. Right. right outside Chicago. Okay. And uh, grandchildren? Did your mom have grandchildren? Yes. So I have two children. Uh, my son, Zach, is 17. And uh, my daughter, Avery, is uh, 13. And my sister has one daughter, Kaylee, K-A-Y-L-E-E. -E, and I believe Kaylee is 12 now. 12. Yeah, 12. Okay. has to be difficult for them too. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest question and, and, and it was tough on them, but being that mom had been in the nursing home and, you know, very slightly ambulatory, not out to get out much. Um, most of the people grow up with a grandparent that they get to go stay over at grandma, grandma and grandpa's house, right? Grandma and grandpa take them for a week. They get to go on vacation with grandma and grandpa. You know, our kids to see grandma was, you know, okay, let's go to the nursing home in a room and maybe try to get grandma to, you know, uh, dinner, the struggle of getting in and out of the car and getting her in the wheelchair and, you know, things. And it's not like, you know, grandma could drop everything and go watch my daughter's soccer game or my son play lacrosse or go see this event. And so they had grown up with a little bit different of, of an aspect as well. Um, you know, I don't think my, my kids or, or my sister's daughter is, are, were as close as my, grand, my mom as, as I am to my grandparents because I spent every waking moment that I wasn't at home at my grandparents' house, you know, because we live so close. Um, but they still, they took it pretty hard. I, I, they, I'll be honest, when, you know, mom was admitted to the hospital, you know, my daughter said the same thing. It says, well, it's grandma. Let's pray that she'll likely be out here in two weeks because that's what happens. Um, and so I think when the, the finality of it hit, it, it was kind of tough on them too. But I think the, the, the best part about it is, is, you know, our, our family has been very uh, rooted in faith all our life. Um, and we knew that finally those, you know, the chains were gone and mom was finally free. It's a good way to look at it. Although a very difficult one. Yeah. Tell me, let's circle back to your mom a little bit more. And if you could isolate two or three memories of, of her, who she was, specific things about her that really kind of define who she was or how, how they made her tick, interactions that you had with her or memories that you have of her over the years, help us understand a couple of those. Sure. I think the biggest thing that, that, uh, that I would share with you is, is that, you know, my mother always had a smile on her face um, and mom always found the positive and not the negative. Um, mom would never focus on negative. That was not mom. Um, and that came from my grandmother, obviously. You know, my grandmother now with the dementia, you know, you ask her how she's doing. She's like, well, I'm okay, you know? And, and so it's always the positive. And that was what mom was, no matter what we, you know, what, what we dealt with, uh, you know, some family trauma or drama or whatever it might be. Mom was always the one that said, we're gonna take the high road. Um, and that's helped me personally through my career in a lot of different aspects. And I think um, it, it, it's really been one of those things that even when there were issues, mom didn't want to focus on those. It was a positive. Um, 
And, you know, she was that way with her health. Um, you know, she'd get frustrated, she'd get, you know, uh, upset, but it was never, what was me. I mean, uh, had it been me uh, with the multiple struggles that she'd had, I'm not sure I could have been as strong as she was to be able to fight through what she did, uh, all those times. And, and she did, she kept fighting. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, it might've been easier to just give up, uh, but that's, that wasn't going to be what she was. Um, and, you know, she always took pride in both her kids. Uh, my sister and I took very different career paths, uh, very different. Um, I love my sister dearly, but we're, we're very different people. Um, and mom didn't love me any more than she'd love my sister. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we'd have the typical sibling fights, whether it would be as a, you know, 13 and uh, 18 year old or as a 40 year old and a 45 year old, right? We, we, we still have our tips. And uh, mom didn't want to hear it. You know, it was, no, we're not going to talk about that. You two work that out, you know. And uh, it was always about, you know, that positive aspect of, of, of things. And, and I think that's, to me, what, what all I will never, you know, I'll, I'll never forget is, is that mom was always that, you know, eternal person that always found the positive in everything that she did. What does your sister do? Uh, she's a, a retail clerk. Uh, in uh, right outside, she actually lives in Plano, Illinois, about an hour outside the city. Sure, yeah, I'm familiar with Plano. I, I grew up in Wheaton. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, there have been a lot of throughout all of this, a lot of different feelings in our country, in our in the region, everywhere about what COVID nineteen is. Um, a lot of people don't take it as seriously as other people do. It's it's just a fact. Some people don't. Uh, some people have denied the severity of it. Uh, it's obviously had just an incredible impact on so many lives. When you hear these things, or if you have the opportunity to take the opportunity to tell somebody in the community what this really is and what the impact can be, uh, what, what would you say to somebody uh, that, that maybe doesn't take it seriously or maybe doesn't want to put on the mask or, or, or you know, somebody that's just not getting it? Sure. You know, I, I go back to, you know, one of those last conversations that we had and, and uh, I, I just literally, you know, spoke with uh, one of our uh, local reporters uh, here with the Toledo Blade this past week uh, about an article that he wrote about our men's and women's basketball program and what we're doing here at Toledo. And, and I, you know, I told Kyle the same thing I'll tell you is, is that, you know, that conversation I had with mom was be safe, but live your life. You know, you have to find a way to live live your life because if you don't and you're scared and you're not doing what it is that you need to do life can get very lonely um and and i think that's one of the things if i if i if i heard the frustration in mom's voice once it was that one of those last times where she said look at me i've sat in this room for seven weeks i didn't leave i never saw anyone and i still got this and she used a four letter word that starts with F that I never heard my mother use. And she goes, I still got this virus. And she, she or the frustration level was there. And she said, I haven't seen my grandkids. I didn't get to hug them. I did, you know, and the list went on and on and on. And so, you know, I tell folks in the, in the world that I live in every day in college athletics, that we have to be diligent or diligent you know, in what we do, right? We, we have to wear our mask, we have to wash our hands, we have to protect our distance. We have to you, you be part of, in our world, in athletics, you know, testing three to six times a week. We've got to do all these things and be safe, but understand that there is a risk, right? But there's a risk if I drive home today, I could get run over by the garbage truck. There's a risk to drink and drive. There's a risk to do a million different things in the world we live in. and and. I just, I'm, I'm of the proponent now, and I have been since the day mom contracted this virus, that risk mitigation and risk level are different in every human being. And I respect that in every human being. Some people want to deny this virus. They're welcome to do that. But their denial then could impact somebody else's issue. And so I, I, my, my response has always been, let's meet the same science that we can all agree on that risk mitigation, masking, distancing, washing hands is going to help us. 
But then if I choose to go to a restaurant or I would like to do this or go visit family, then that's a risk that I'm willing to take or you're willing to take or, or whatever. But we have to understand and respect each other's understanding of this virus and respect the risk levels that we're willing to take all the while understanding the public health aspect of, of what this can do to those folks like mom who are at risk, even if they do everything right.